In this video, we're going to try and understand what we mean by climate negotiation, but that means we have to look back because the past is going to shed light on what is happening today and what will happen tomorrow. First, we need to understand, or rather, the first question is, what are we going to negotiate about? What, kind, what type of commitment are we going to negotiate? The price of carbon, uniform taxes that could be applied everywhere, emission quotas per country, and negotiating on quota because of uncertainties regarding costs. It means that we then will have to use uh, markets of negotiable permits that, that will be traded between countries. Or do we want to understand policies and measurements, metrics? Do we want to agree on a uh, pace of reduction on the global scale and on the country scale? What kind of gases are we going to cover? All gases, only CO2, do we include forests? And finally, the binding commitment issue that we're not going to discuss in this video, but that you should always bear in mind because it is a highly important political issue. The current negotiation is branded by the past. The climate issue was put on the international agenda following a G7 decision whereby it was decided that in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro a climate convention would be adopted. Now, in the G7, there were people, famous people such as George Bush Sr. or Margaret Thatcher, and uh, they did not really like uh, environmental protection and after a couple of years of negotiating on the entropic origin of the warming uh, process, it is easy to understand the uh, surprising uh, outcome because at the time the oil prices were low, there was the so-called reverse oil crisis and uh, people at the time, heads of state, understood the situation was uh, dangerous because uh, the, whole, the whole energetic uh, problem was put between the hands uh, of uh, those countries where the price of energy was lowest, i.e. the Middle East. In Europe and in the United States, everybody agreed to move forward. And Europe started uh, by suggesting a mixed tax, carbon and energy, 50% on carbon, 50% on energy. But the proposal was not adopted because France withdrew its support to the proposal. And then something rather typical happened and something that would happen in all the negotiation, the fact that interests were not fully understood, or rather the spokespeople of a given interest were not sufficiently informed or sufficiently loyal to the interests they were defending. On the one hand, there was the French industry complaining about competitiveness, dangers or risks. And yet, it was quite easy to understand that the industry that would have suffered most from a carbon tax would be the German industry because they were much more carbon intensive than the French industry. Second interest, the nuclear energy. The uh, mixed tax was blamed for transferring part of the uh, tax on energy and the French consider that the nuclear energy is a clean energy, therefore not included for the French. And Germany and Sweden would never have accepted a tax that would only bear on carbon. It would have been good for France, but because people did not really inter understand each other's interests, Europe finally was not able to defend this uh, proposal in Rio de Janeiro. In Rio de Janeiro, we had the Climate Convention, committing to start every year a new process whereby the uh, conference of the parties would meet to try and uh, comply with what would be adopted. But the agreement was fairly vague in its expectations, except that it was absolutely necessary to limit global warming to a temperature which was not specified. So negotiations started, and the turning point was the uh, Berlin terms of reference. It was understood at the time that Germany would suffer from a mixed tax, and the government, with Mrs. Merkel, who at the time was the uh, Minister for the Environment, tried to avoid a carbon tax, which was the original German 
uh, sorry, European idea. So they came to the meeting announcing minus 25% of emissions, all the more easily because they were about to absorb East Germany and uh, East Germany was about to be restructured and East Germany emitted a lot of CO2, so it was relatively easy for them to take that commitment. Countries started negotiating on a budget of uh, remaining emissions, but questions were raised on the fairness of the division. It's absolute, It's very difficult to negotiate, and emerging countries asked the question directly on how to share the rights, and obviously northern countries were hard put to provide an answer, and the American Senate unanimously adopted a motion announcing they would never ratify an agreement on that basis unless developing countries took a significant commitment, significant being a diplomatic phrase. It was therefore difficult to commit to sharing the residual emissions and the Kyoto Protocol adopted the system with caps or quotas and uh, permit markets. It was done in such a way that everything was still possible. P countries were still in a capacity to commit on caps. And internally, they could take the necessary provisions or the necessary economic policies freely. The Kyoto Protocol, if it had been well interpreted, could have uh, rescued the situation. But it suffered from two different situations, Germany imposing conditions in order to keep the negotiation going for three years, because Germany was doing its best to avoid carbon taxes that would threaten the uh, industry's competitiveness, and also an ideological drift. Countries moved from an idea of a carbon trade between countries to a generalized market on the global scale. A 50 euro price of carbon would have doubled the price of concrete, for instance, in India, cement. And therefore, this could not be applied. Therefore, the whole attempt was a failure. confirmed by the sixth conference of the party, which took place in The Hagen and the following year in Marrakesh. And then George Bush Jr., who withdrew the US from the process for about eight years. Now, it all started again in Bali, then in Copenhagen, and at the time, countries uh, hoped that uh, the situation would improve with Obama's uh, arrival as a president of the United States, forgetting that the failure of the negotiations were not simply due to George Bush, but the fact that it was impossible to agree with uh, the American administration, which in reality was the most favorable there had ever been for environmental Obama. issues. When Obama took, the, took power, there was a small incident that the media did not cover. Ted Kennedy's death meant that Obama lost the 60-40 majority in the Congress, in the Senate, to get his proposal adopted uh, without a coalition. And we understood finally that four years later he had trouble getting the proposal agreed. We should have known that in Copenhagen nothing was possible because Obama simply was not free to do what he wanted. Finally, we abandoned the idea of a quota approach, uh, the Berlin quota approach, and uh, it's, the idea was now to open the negotiation towards uh, climatic uh, issues and development policies, except that this was done in an unfavorable context with a, uh, an economic crisis and geopolitical power struggles with emerging countries such as China or India. So we forgot for years the Gordian knot between climate and development. We trapped ourselves uh, in a a conflict game around a uh, fair sharing of uh, residual emission budgets. And finally, we forgot that there was ideological use of the agenda of the various countries.